day great cloud that had come for the feast that Jesus was on his heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem they took palm tree, palm branches and went to meet him shouting Hosanna blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the king of Israel Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written do not be afraid O daughter of Zion see that your king is coming seated on the great the donkey colt. Thank you, Nick. Well, exciting times. Lots of good things happening. It's good to see, uh, as Nancy says, your eyes. Can't see your face, but at least I can see your eyes, and uh, that's a good thing to be able to get to see people and be around some people. Uh, just to let you know, you get a treat next week. Joshua Dubois is going to be preaching, so uh, come ready to hear Joshua and bring your emails. Uh, Nancy and I are going on vacation, and so we are. Actually, going to leave town and go to Washington and see our oldest son. He is turning a horrible age. I don't know how he got a son so old. Well, Nancy and I haven't aged at all, but somehow uh, he's gotten much, much older. And so Joshua will be preaching. And then the next Sunday is a fifth Sunday, and I usually have one of the guys preach on that, so Joe is going to preach on that one. And so that should be a good good experience. I'm looking forward to hearing those guys. We don't want to talk about King Jesus and about our response to King Jesus today, what that really means. What's our response? I don't know how you feel people respond to you. It has changed, definitely, hasn't it? I mean, sometimes people go up and they go, I don't know what to do. You might going to shake your hand, am I going to hug you, am I going to bump elbows or fists or maybe tap feet or what, what am I going to do with you now? And so we get all kinds of different reactions from people about, you know, what do we do with each other anymore? We don't quite know how that works. But somehow we get through it and it all works out okay. You can tell when some people really like you and, you know, they just have a big smile behind their mask that you can't see. So just assume it's there. I mean, just that that's already there and that's already going and, and yeah, they already like you. And, you know, you don't want to assume the frown is there, but you've seen people like that. Uh, you can kind of tell in your eyes exactly what's going on with them and exactly how they are. And so different people respond to us differently. Different people responded to Jesus differently. And the passage that Nick has read to us today, it's one of those where it talks about this time of praise, where Jesus stages this. Uh, he knows it's the last week, and so as he comes to Jerusalem, he says, I want you to go and find the colt, and they bring it to him, and he's going to borrow it, he's going to come in, he's going to be riding this colt as if he were the conquering hero. And it's one of those where we're able to see, as John describes all of this, the different people and how they respond to him. Uh, you can see them happy. You can see them excited. They have great joy. They, I never thought of putting my coat on the floor for a donkey to ride past, but it's a great honor. And that's what they're trying to do. The palm branches and the sharp hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that he's the king of Israel. And so they put their coats on the road in honor. They wave the palm branches in honor. It's, it's like a parade that you've been to, but even more, because this has audience participation. And here they are able to be able to actually be part of the parade. And so as they bring Jesus in, he gets in toward the city, and you can find more and more people. And this is the way the conquering hero would come back, having won the great battle and having come back from war, and now they're welcoming him home and 
so you can see Jesus as he's going toward this time when he's able to say, yes, I am the king. And yet, really, we don't see many times of praise for Jesus. If you think about it, most of the time he's arguing with someone, isn't he? That's what happens a lot of the time, and so he's always trying to discuss something, and he has a time standing against the Pharisees and standing with what he needs to say, and they're always objecting and criticizing, and uh, it seems like we don't have very much praise in the Bible for Jesus. And so we don't seem to see that. We're lacking in that kind of language. And so I'm not sure we really do well at praising God because we don't have the language there. We don't quite know what's going on with that. And so it's, it's one of those things that's a little bit difficult. Um, and on top of that, we tend to shy away from worship, don't we? I mean, I'm glad you guys came. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're part of this. But a lot of times people are like, well, do I need to go? Except that's not what they say. They say, do I have to go? Uh, as if they don't want to. Why wouldn't you part, be, want to be a part of something that's really exciting? Why wouldn't you want to be a part of someone who is Lord of heaven and earth, and you're able to talk about him, and you're able to worship him, and so... But I think we have a difficult time with praise. We don't exactly know how to do that. We need to learn how to respond to Jesus better. And to be able to have this kind of praise for God and this praise for what Jesus is and who Jesus is. You know, the kind where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That kind of praise. And certainly we see that language in the Bible, but we don't see many examples of it. Most of the examples are about the difficulties that they face and about things that go wrong. And so there are difficulties that they face. Jesus, as you're aware, is one who is brought to trial, finally, and as he stands before Pilate, they are questioning what to do with Jesus. There's been a custom at Passover that they would be able to release one of the prisoners, kind of a goodwill gesture toward the people. And so Paul tries to suggest, why don't I release Jesus? And the people don't seem very receptive to that. What about Barabbas? Oh, yes, give us Barabbas. We want you to release Barabbas for us. And so you can see the, the people responding to that in and, and, and Matthew 27, verse 20. He says, Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two of you do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. And so Pilate asked the crowd, well, who do you want to release? And thinking, let's, let's release the innocent man. No, they don't want to release the innocent man. They want to release the guilty man. Yeah. And what do you want to do with Jesus? The innocent one. I don't find any sin in him. Well, let's crucify him. Let's crucify him. The crowd doesn't work on logic, do they? It's not about, well, let's see, who is the guiltiest, who's done the worst, who has... No, it's not that at all. In fact, they've just kind of lost their mind at this point. Yeah, let's, let's crucify Jesus. And there are some others who are going to be crucified, some other criminals along with him. And the whole reason is because the chief priests and the elders had been able to sway the crowd. And so as Pilate tries to talk to the crowd about Jesus and about what Jesus has done, they, they're not going to have any of it. And he tries to explain the logic of, well, this is your king. Why wouldn't you release your king? Oh, no, we want him to be crucified. 
and so they're very angry and they're very upset and the chief priests and the elders are stirring all of this up. Isn't this the same crowd a week earlier was asking for Jesus to be their king? Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What changed? How did this become different? How did this become into the mob mentality of all of a sudden everybody's angry? And everybody's upset and they don't know what to do with this. But they know that they want Barabbas released and they know that they want Jesus crucified. And that's what they know. And so they're going to insist on that. Well, Pilate doesn't have much option for what he's going to do. How is he ever going to accomplish this? It's pretty easy to see that the crowd's been swayed by somebody else. It isn't because of them. Uh, the passage talks about it was because of envy that they had delivered him up. And so there's all kind. Of, how would you do that? How would you turn people against them? What if we picked a person in here that we wanted to crucify next week? Can we just pick somebody and say, well, how do we turn everybody against them? Well, what would you do? Well, we start criticizing them, right? Talk about how bad they are. Talk about all their failures. Talk about the stuff that didn't go right. Talk about the things that didn't work well. Yeah, I don't know that they you know, really even should be here after all. I mean... How can we have them here? And then you put the pressure of the situation, and then you have to make a choice, and then they just get talked into the emotion more than anything else. It has nothing to do with logic whatsoever. And no, it's not you. We're not going to crucify anybody next week. Unless Joshua has plans. No. No. Have we ever done that, though? Turned against somebody? Said something against somebody, and now they know we said something, and maybe they don't like us, and they don't know why we said something that was so mean and so hurtful and so hateful about who they are, and how would this ever happen? How would we ever do this? And so... Yeah, I think we see the world like that now. We're living in a reactionary world to the things that happen, to the things that are going on in our time. Everything is not always good. And we find the pressure of the situation, the threat of disease and death, and that kind of hangs over us. And then we get all kinds of other pressures coming in. Some of the things are, are very very bad about what's going on in our world, about some racial tension and things like that. It exists. It's there. We need to do something with that. And yet we don't know how to change the world for that. Some people just seem to have lost their mind, and today might be the best day for you. This is going to be a great day. Everything's going to go right. Everything's going to go well. Everything's going to be good. And so you're so happy and excited for the day. Or you get one of those other moods. Today is not going to be a good day. I've already broken a fingernail. I've already stubbed my toe. I'm sure one of my tires is going to go flat. It's not going to be a good day. It didn't start off well. And the first person we see just might as well just blow up at him. Because it's not a good day for me. And we vent our anger, and it all comes out at once, and it really doesn't have any reason or logic to it. It isn't anything that the other person did against us, and it isn't anything that they were there for. But boy, it comes out in a flurry, and it gets all over everybody. And when we see that kind of thing happening, it's, it's amazing to watch, and it's really so sad. How can things fall apart so fast where everything is bad and everyone is mad at you and some things just don't work for us? We get in the mood. Well, not us. Other people get in those moods. We're justified, right? Other people get in those moods. And we have become very good at anger. 
not so good at the rejoicing and the praise. I want to share with you about another man that we were able to read out loud in Scripture. And that man is Saul. He starts with the anger side. And he starts with the fact that there are these people called Christians. He is a good Jewish person, and he has done everything to serve God all of his life, all in the Jewish tradition. And now there's all these other people called Christians claiming Messiah has already come. How can that be possible? And he was very mad, very upset at them. And so in Acts 9, it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it will be told you what you are to do. And so we see Saul is so angry. After all, these people are not doing it right. This is not the way I grew up. This is not what I know to be true. All I know to be true is the law of Moses. And all I know to be true is all of the things that have been true for for years and years, all of the prophecy about a Messiah. And now you think that that Messiah is, what, already come? How can that possibly be? And so he gets letters to be able to go throw more people in prison. After all, this is not legal. It's not what you're supposed to be doing. This is not accepted in our country. And so he goes, he's breathing threats and murder. That's not a good person to meet in the morning, is it? But that's what he's about. And he thinks that we just got to nip this in the bud and we'll get rid of it right away. And so the more aggressive you can be about it, and his response to Jesus is anger. He does not know what to do with this. He is angry about some people claiming he's the Messiah because he knows the law. He knows what is promised. He knows all about that. He is a scholar of the law. He has it all, in fact. He has the perfect place in society. He's had those good days where everything goes right and everything is well. After all, he's a Pharisee. He's one of the people who seems to be in leadership at this time. He has it all figured out. He's part of the group that crucified Jesus. He's one of the people that has stoned Stephen. They are going to get rid of this Christian stuff. He has all the credentials. He's blameless according to the law of Moses. He's zealous for his persecution of the church. He had risen to the top in Judaism. And all that means he doesn't know Jesus. And Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. And it's such an interesting time. He's persecuting the church, and yet Jesus says to him, Why are you persecuting me? Because it's personal. Why are you persecuting me? He says, well, who are you, Lord? I thought I was doing this right. I I did it right according to everything that I knew. He said, well, there's the issue is you need to know some more. And so I want you to go into Damascus and I'll send somebody. You didn't even tell him? I mean, isn't this important? Shouldn't we be right there to say, well, this is what you have to do. Do it right now. And he doesn't. Why not? Sometimes it takes a while for us to accept things and to get ready for things. And to take a person with so much anger, how are you going to turn them into a person of faith? And Jesus' response seems to be, I'm going to let him sit with his anger for a while. Paul has been blinded on the road, the light shone around him, and he can't see anything else. Everybody can see but him. So he is taken into Damascus, and he sits for three days. And he doesn't eat for three days. And he prays for three days. 
He can't see anything. And it might take that amount of time to be able to deal with the anger that you've got. I'm not sure we do that with people that are angry anymore. Put them in a room by themselves and let them sit for three days. And the Lord comes and he talks to Ananias and he says, I've got a guy there who is going to be a great disciple and I want you to go talk to him. So, and he objects, Saul, no, I've heard about him. I don't want to do well talk to him. He's dangerous. He's angry. He says, no, you don't understand. We need to be able to face that kind of anger and deal with that kind of anger. Because it's going to be turned into praise and all the things that Paul is able to do. And so as you think about it, he's able to send him there. Ananias doesn't want to go. And he says, I've already told him you're coming. He knows your name. Well, if he already knows your name and knows it's Ananias and knows he's going to be there, then he goes and talks to Saul. In Acts 17, or 9, 17, it says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And Elias has two things he's supposed to do with him. Two things that he's supposed to accomplish. One is take away the blindness so that he's able to see. And so he lays hands on him, and it's like scales fall off, and he's able to see now don't know exactly what happened or the way that works, but it works, and he's able to be there, and he takes away the blindness so that now he's able to see clearly again. Well, that's one of them. The second one is I want you to receive the Holy Spirit. And so that's a result. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, the way you get the Holy Spirit, he cannot come into a person's life unless he's first clean unless he's first forgiven of his sins. And so he takes him and he baptizes him for the remission of his sins so that he is able to receive the Holy Spirit. It's it's exactly the same message that Peter talked about when he was there. He already has a lot of knowledge. He's already a professor when it comes to the Jewish law, but he just hadn't been able to put things together right. And so he didn't know how to do that. And when we see him go through this process, this repentance of this angry man that he has been, and this baptism into Jesus, and this filling with the Holy Spirit, he loses the anger, but he keeps the drive. He immediately starts telling people about Jesus, and so he begins this life of praise. I like where Paul in his letters will write, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice as he writes from prison. It's not your situation or circumstance or your mood that brings about rejoicing. It's the fact that God is to be praised, and so we are able to bring about that praise. And so he receives that spirit, and we see the life of Paul at such an amazing time. where he's able to do so many things and able to accomplish so much as he establishes churches and as he does things for Jesus. He's sent on missionary journeys. He's sent to go out and establish his churches everywhere. And so he has the knowledge. He meets with the church in Damascus first. He preaches about Jesus being the Son of God. And of course that starts the people being angry at him. He's no longer the angry man, but now they're against him the same way they they were against Jesus. And so we see that that continues. So it is, we do not live in reaction to the world. We live in response to Jesus. And I think that's really where we need to be. 
It's not about all the other stuff that's going on in the world. And some of it is really, really bad. And we're going to get through it. It's going to be okay, but it's going to be hard. But the first thing is our response to Jesus. And so what is our response to Jesus? How do we do that? Well, we could be angry about the state of the world and angry that Jesus hasn't done something. Look how many things are going wrong. There's virus, there's election, there's all these other things. Kids are trying to go to school and some of them are not going to school and some teachers are in school. Some teachers are not going to school. There's online classes and now they they, what, they have to stay home with me? Are you kidding? And so we had all this thought out and then jobs are gone and you can't get out and you can't do things and there's so much in our life that has been disrupted. And then you see abusive people because of this and there are more and more angry people. Or we can learn how to respond to Jesus. Not respond to the world, but respond to Jesus. And we respond in the praise. Maybe you didn't bring your palm branch this week. You can bring it next week, and we'll, well, that's Josh goes to the palm branches. But we're going to be singing. Jonathan always does a great job leading our singing, and it's good to be able to see him up here. We're going to be shouting praise and hosanna and praise to the Son of God. And so how do you respond to Jesus? Are we like the crowd that first is... Blessed by Jesus so much because we got fish and bread and it's going to be great and we're, as long as the blessings keep coming, we're good. Now we're going to be like the crowd that's angry at the fact that nothing's going our way and we may not even know why. And everybody else is mad, so I ought to be mad too. Everybody else is upset, well, it kind of makes me upset, and so we can all be angry together. When you look at Paul, you realize he's willing to give up everything to have Jesus. He's willing to give up all of the things he had done before, all of the standing he had in the Jewish community, in order that he might know Jesus, in order that he might let Jesus take control of his life. So what do I expect you to do today? Well, one thing is you aren't blind. I can see your eyes. And you may have repented and been baptized. If you haven't done that, then I want to encourage you to do that. And let that Holy Spirit that comes into your life guide you. Let that Spirit that comes in be part of you. And learn to worship Jesus. And serve Jesus. And love Jesus. And tell other people about Jesus. When Jesus talks to Peter, he says, I want you to feed my sheep. He's already left and gone fishing, and now he says, no, go back, feed my sheep. What we do here is extremely, extremely important. And so we need to be busy telling people about Jesus. And maybe you have to deal with the angry man first. Try sitting for three days by yourself. Turn out the lights. See if that doesn't help your attitude as you pray. If that's what it takes, do that. But maybe it won't take you three days. It may be that you'll understand already, here's what I need to do. If you need to repent of your sins and be baptized in the Christ, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to serve. I encourage you to worship Jesus and bring about all the good things of God in your life. Would you come while we stand and sing? That concludes our lesson. We want to thank you for watching this presentation. If you would like to see more, please feel free to visit our YouTube channel or our church website for additional content. And just a reminder that our Sunday morning Bible class starts at 9.30 a.m., followed by our 10.30 worship. As always, thank you for taking time out to watch this video and have a blessed day.